What's up, investors? Chase here from the Node MBA podcast. And on this week's episode, we talk all about insurance with the recent happenings down in Texas or here in Texas, I should say, with Harvey. We've got Irma off the coast of Florida, general fires and tornadoes, and it just it feels like a Sim City simulation situation. That was tough. So we decided to talk about insurance. A lot of people were asking for it after our last episode where we decided to pivot, do a show every other week and bring a little bit better, uh, more in-depth content. So this week we have an interview with Mel Babkis from Ross Diversified. He talks all about insurance. He talks about the force place insurance, what CFPB and Dodd-Frank require. He talks about blanket policies, umbrella policies, how to get coverage, what coverage, co- like. He just talks about all how to be an FBI agent and go through a collateral file and, and find the insurance that you currently have. He's just, he's so knowledgeable. He just goes so in depth on so many different areas regarding how insurance works and how you should be managing it for your real estate business. Definitely check out this week's episode right now. Hey guys, before we get into this week's episode, just want to let you know we are headed out to the Distressed Mortgage Expo in Southern California. If you were thinking about headed out there and you wanted to meet, greet, hang out, network, go do it. Use promo code NOTE25 to get 25 bucks off. We don't get a kickback, you just get savings for being part of the community. We appreciate you. Go to NoteMBA.com slash SoCal. Plug in the coupon, get a ticket, head out to the Distressed Mortgage Expo in Southern California. Anyway, I look forward to seeing anybody out there. I look forward to networking. Let's get into the show. First, seconds, performing, non-performing? What the f***? Note buyers, when it seems like you're in this business alone, know Chase, Robert, and the rest of their tribe are at it every week. They're bringing updates from their own note businesses as they work to find, fund, and finish deals. Follow along as they share their grassroots education with you, tuition-free. If you'd like to know more about what they do and to download the entire back catalog, check out NoteMBA.com. Now, here are your hosts, Chase Thompson and Robert Woods. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Note MBA podcast, your home for note investing on iTunes. I am Chase Thompson, and this week we've got a really interesting show for you. Now, we talked last week that is to say two weeks ago, about the new structure and style of this show. We wanted to bring you guys more in-depth topics, things that you wanted us to talk about. We got a ton of submissions and the top of the list by far coming across on Facebook, LinkedIn, email, just talking to investors every single day was insurance. Now, obviously what precipitated that was the hurricane coming through here in Texas, specifically down in Houston. We know investors that were affected by this, not just in their you know investment properties, but in their own personal properties. We see uh, one of my favorite investors, Chad Raggio out of Houston. He's got pictures up on Instagram and like Instagram videos of his son and him going, you know, around the neighborhood, helping people get things cleared up. And it's just incredible the way that the community is coming together down there. But that led a lot of investors to asking us about insurance. So we brought on one of our favorite service providers, Mel Babkis of Ross Diversified, to talk all about insurance. We dive deep in this episode. We talk about how to be an FBI agent going through your collateral files, finding the insurance that you might or might not have, where to go from there. We talk force place insurance. We talk CFPB, what is required because of CFPB and Dodd-Frank when it comes to insurance, how much insurance to get, how to go about getting insurance, how to, what coverages come through. Is it flood? Is it fire? Is it damages? What is covered when it comes to insurance? We talk about umbrella policies, REO insurance. I mean, we, we dive deep. Mel's a 30 year vet in the business. And he's also an investor. He talks about his note business, how he's been investing in notes since the 80s. One of my favorite things about dealing or doing business with people like Mel is that they get it. You know, all too often, we're meeting with a real estate agent or we're meeting with a service provider that just doesn't get it. They don't know what we're after. They don't know what it means to invest in notes. They don't know what it means to invest in real estate, even real estate agents sometimes. When you're getting comps back and just different things from them, it's crazy. So we've got Mel on the show, an investor, a guy who gets it, a guy who knows it. 
and uh, it's, it's just a great episode. It's thick. He goes on a lot of just tangents and tirades and goes off on all of the different aspects that you guys need to understand when it comes to insurance for your business. Super cool. Very great dude. Cannot wait for you guys to check out this episode. So without further ado, here's Mel Babkis of Ross Diversified. Mel, thank you so much for jumping on the horn with us today. Um, I literally reached out to y'all Friday before one of the biggest travel uh, holidays of the year, uh, right on the on the cusp of a gas shortage here in Texas. Labor Day weekend was crazy, and I reached out to you guys on Friday to come on the show because we had so many listeners. Uh, just we, obviously, we have the the salient point of uh, Hurricane Harvey just hitting Texas, but then we've also got uh, some people having some issues out on some uh, Florida properties. We've got another named storm that's kind of getting um, underway out there. So. I appreciate you just the ridiculous turn time. Thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So obviously in the intro mentioned who you guys are, a little bit about what you do, but give us a little bit of the background. Give us a little bit of the story. I mean, you just showed me a wonderful uh, uh, <laughs> a small piece of what Ross <laughs> does. He's got this. He's got this beautiful can of nuts. I can't even explain it to you guys. He's got like his face photoshopped. It's it's just this wonderful. Uh, yeah, this, it's a, this is an amazing marketing piece. But give us an idea of who you are, what you do, and and uh, and all that kind of stuff, please. My pleasure. I was just holding up our famous Ross Diversified Nuts. And Ross Diversified Insurance, uh, we started in 1986. Uh, my brother and I started the agency. Uh, we have a very small staff. We've been in business now 31 years. Um, and when you talk about turnaround time, uh, our staff is small, but we like to answer that phone on the very first ring. Uh, we've been involved I- in this space uh, for, again, over 30 years, uh, working with private investors as well as other institutions, credit unions, mortgage lender services, as well as a few banks as, as well along the way. Uh, in our 30 plus years, we've seen a lot of different cycles uh, from the uh, loan cycle of private investors loaning on different properties, as well as my brother, myself, our profit share, we're investors as well. We, we've bought notes since the uh, the late 80s, uh, both performing notes, non-performing notes. Uh, we've gone through some, some ups and downs and we're had our own experience with REOs as well and evictions. And so not only are we um, on the insurance side, but we live and breathe the other side. We believe in the investment model. We actively look at properties right now and notes uh, for our profit share. So we're on both sides of this fence as far as looking at it from how best to protect ourselves with our own insurance products, as well as working with private investors with the different insurance products. So that was one of the things that you had mentioned that I was so excited about, right? Is that you get it. We deal with so many different service providers or vendors just in life that just maybe aren't aligned with where we're at. And so we've got to sit down, you know, I've, I've had to build teams across different places in the country and I've got to sit down with an agent and explain what note investing is time and time again to just different people, right? So when you mentioned that you, you, you're in the same boat, not half the time or 20, you know, I'm not going to quantify it, but you're in the same boat. You do the same things and bring that knowledge to kind of the other service side of it, of insurance. Uh, that was awesome. You know, like you get what we are dealing with a lot of times. You're able to explain it in verbiage. We understand that kind of thing was extremely helpful. So that was really awesome. So that's, I was pumped to have you on knowing that that was the case. Uh, so really excited to kind of jump in on where would you have a start, right? So I explained to you that a lot of people that listen to the show are brand new, right? Like brand new to real estate investing, not just note investing, right? Where would you have a start when it comes to just insurance in general? I know a term that a lot of people are going to throw around is something like force place insurance, things like that. But where have you found the most success when it comes to starting off this large kind of topic of, of insurance for, for these types of investment deals? Where, where do you find that success? Well, the first step would be what what are you actually buying? And when an investor comes in, you know, there's different segments in this market where you can buy, buy a, a performing first trustee. Maybe someone sells their house uh, for sale by owner and takes back a certain amount of, of, of carry back and it's a performing note. And that person might want to discount that note on the marketplace so that they can have cash right away. There's other, obviously, uh, different entities that sell servicing notes 
where they're performing. So what you do is you need to know what you're buying, what the ad you know, is located geographically, and then what risks go along with it. So for example, if I buy a, a performing first trust deed note, meaning I'm in first position on that note, um, then uh, when I'm buying that note in the note and deed, there's usually a space for the borrower when he's taking out originating that note that he is going to promise to uh, have a fire insurance policy to protect the lender uh, of that note. So you want to go the very first step in, in, in going through your loan file is you want to go and you want to find out if there's an insurance policy in that file. If let's say I'm uh, borrowing money from you and uh, I have my insurance, let's say for with Allstate or Farmers or whoever, I have to make sure that you're listed on that insurance policy uh, under the lender's loss payable protection, which is a lot of times people call it the 438 BFU. It's an old terminology, but basically what it's doing is it's putting me on that insurance policy saying, if there's anything that goes wrong on that house, then I'm going to be party to that insurance policy. So for example, if the house burns down, the check's going to come to you as the owner of the property, but it's also going to have my name on it as the lender. So you can't just take the money and run. And then we can both work on whether we're going to rebuild that money, uh, rebuild that property, or if maybe you're just going to pay off the assets and, and and have a free and clear lot. I mean, it depends on where the, the, the property is, what the property is worth. Most of the time, people are rebuilding their home, and that's all you're trying to do. The whole point of insurance is really to make you whole prior to what you were the day before the loss. So that's all we're trying to do. You're not trying to uh, game the insurance company. Sometimes you, you get more money than the house is worth. Uh, but you're you're really all you're trying to do is make sure that you're whole going in. So you want to be listed on that insurance policy. So when you say where do you start, you go through a file and you find out if the the agent's the Allstate agent, then you want to go out. You want to make sure that you're listed on there is the the lender loss payable endorsement. That's your first step. Um, when you go into a, a situation and you buy a loan file, that loan file may or may not be complete. It may or may not have this information. So you have to play FBI agent. You have to go out and you have to find out if there's an insurance policy. And if you find out that there's not an insurance policy or you have no communication with the borrower, uh, for example, if the note's a non-performing note, you normally, uh, the borrower doesn't pay his insurance, doesn't pay his taxes, it doesn't pay you. That's an indication that the note's uh, you know, normally doesn't have insurance on it if they're not paying on their mortgage or paying on their taxes, et cetera. So it's your responsibility purchasing that note to make sure that you're protected. If you're not protected on that note, then you have the option to put what they call force place, lender place protection, which means you're placing insurance on that asset to protect yourself because there's no insurance there. If the owner of the home is an owner-occupied home, then there's certain regulations from Dodd-Frank that uh, they have what they call the CFPB, the, the Consumer Fraud Protection Bureau letters that need to go out. So for example, if I find out you don't have insurance on that asset, you want to force place insurance to protect yourself, then I need to notify you. I need to send you out a letter saying, this is what I'm going to do. This is what it's going to cost. This is what it's going to cover. It's kind of a negative type of letter and it says, get off your duff and furnish me a policy uh, so that I can get this policy canceled. And you normally send that letter out uh, day one and then 30 days later, you send out a, the same kind of format letter. The, the letter is actually formatted and we do have those letters uh, right from the, the CFPB. So those are how you protect yourself to find out. You kind of have to do your own FBI uh, research to find out if there's insurance on there. If there's not insurance on there, then you have to protect yourself right away. If it's an owner-occupied home, then you have to notify that borrower of what you're doing. Now, if you're buying a second trust deed or you're buying a non-performing note in a discounted situation, you might look at that file a little bit differently than you're going to look at a performing note. Um, and that gets to be how much coverage you want to place on the property. So that was where I was going to cut in on you there. I would say most people that would be listening to this are going to be buying in that non-performing position, right? Enjoying the discount. They want to get the workout. Uh, they want to, you know, buy from their own portfolio to grow, say, uh, a rental portfolio or a paying, a uh, performing portfolio, whatever the case may be, right? So in that scenario, though you still need to be an FBI agent through the collateral file for insurance purposes and everything else, uh, I've seen payoffs. And so, I mean, like I've seen checks. I've seen all kinds of stuff inside of a collateral file. But um, when you're doing the if most people are going to be buying that non-performing position that forced place position 
how are they going to value that? How, what are they valuing? Is it what they paid for, what it's worth? What are you typically seeing in the marketplace? Or what's that, best, that's, maybe, it might be a better question, right? That That's a really, really good question. And you have a couple of different options open to you. First off, let me just pull some numbers out of space so I can do the math real quick in my head. Let's say that uh, you buy a note that has a face value of $100,000 on it. But maybe you buy that at a discount of maybe 50 cents on, on the dollar, and you're paying $50,000 for that note. Now let's take the insurance piece. Insurance is always tied to the value of the structure. When it comes to insurance, and I'll use the same numbers to keep them easy in my head, let's say that house is 1,000 square foot at $100 a square foot. So the structure of the house is worth $100,000. So I'm making this example real easy. So now I bought a note that has a $50,000 face value. We're leaving land out of this altogether. And um, I want to now decide how much insurance should I put on that structure. I can insure it for up to the value of the structure, the whole $100,000. Now, because I paid $50,000 for this $100,000 note, I might say, you know what, I don't want to uh, advance anything more than I have to. I just want to protect my interest in here, so I'm going to put $50,000 worth of coverage on that note. You have the option to do that when you're purchasing a note and you're protecting that collateral. That means you can put the value of the structure or less now let me take the same uh, note and, and kind of reverse the circumstances a little bit to show you the difference. Let's say now, I um, and I live in Southern California, um, let's just say that uh, I bought a note on a house that's sitting right on the bluff in Malibu, and that house property and the house on it is worth $5 million all day long, and I just purchased a note for $2 million on this $5 million property. Well, that land and that property that sits on the bluff might be worth $4 million of that $5 million property. Let's just say, for example, I have that same 1,000-square-foot, $100-a-square-foot house on that structure there so that my value of my structure is $100,000. So now I bought this note, this $5 million property that I bought a note for $3 million on the property, but the actual structure, not the market value, the actual structure is only worth $100,000. It doesn't matter what I paid for that note. I can't insure it for more than the value of the structure of the property. So if the house burns down, I'll get $100,000. If I put $3 million worth of insurance on that because I'm in the note $3 million, it doesn't matter whatsoever. It's strictly the value of the structure. So when an adjuster comes out to a property, nobody cares how much you bought the note for. Nobody cares what property values are selling at. Maybe it's going up. Maybe it's going down in a down market. Uh, you know, values are, are dropping and maybe they're below replacement costs. In an up market, maybe they're, uh, you know, selling a lot higher than replacement costs. The adjuster that goes out, whether it's Allstate or Farmers or where have you, they're going to look at it and say it's a 1,000 square foot. The house was built in 1971 or 1980, whatever the year it was. And they go through kind of a guide. They use Marshall Swift is kind of like a blue book of homes and these softwares are pretty accurate and these guys are, are pretty smart, sharp they can google search the house and, and see what it looked like 10 days before the fire and they can talk to neighbors and they can see what the the area you know of, of the neighborhood houses are like and so they can adjust that pretty close to exactly what that value is now there might be a little bit of arm wrestling here and there and if you fixed up a house and you have pictures to support it then obviously you have a, a higher replacement cost of that particular structure but it, nobody's going to ask you, oh, you paid this for the note or the note was X uh, or the market value of these homes are now Y. All we're going to do is the math. It's square footage, uh, the dollar cost per square foot, and then the damage of the property based on square footage only. So uh, just to kind of reiterate what I just said is if the replacement cost of the structure is uh, greater than your note, you can insure it for that amount. If the replacement cost of the structure is a lot less than that note, then you can only insure it for the replacement cost of that structure. So nobody's insuring your note. Nobody's insuring your investment. They're strictly insuring the structure. The land might go up or down, but the structure is going to stay the same. So when you're forced placing insurance, you're typically forced placing for the replacement cost of that structure. 
However, in a case where you might buy something, let's say at 10 cents on the dollar and it's, you know, in the street part of some hard areas of Detroit or different areas that have really had some hard times over the last couple of decades, you might be able to buy something very, very cheap. You can insure it for a lesser amount. You can't insure it for an over amount. Does, does that make sense? Makes a ton of sense. And that was kind of, I, I've never been able to lock anyone down long enough that works in this space to be able to answer it for that many minutes. Like that is all of the clarification I'm going to need moving forward unless there's some dramatic change in the insurance space. That's fantastic. So, and and, and just so you know, if, if, you know, you listen to this podcast as an investor out there, uh, you know, again, my brother and I run Ross Diversified. Uh, we uh, we have cell phones that we answer seven days a week. We know a lot of people buy notes and they're not necessarily doing it during their nine to five hours. So if we get a call in the evening, as long as it's not too late, my wife will get pissed off. But if you need to, you know, kind of bring up the situation, go through it with us, both myself, my brother, Bruce Young, who's been in our office for 20, 25 years now, uh, we can answer these kind of questions. We can rehash it out because we really want when, when you when you set up a policy with with Ross Diversified, we, we want to find out who you are. There's a setup process involved uh, where if it's you're buying the note, in, let's say an LLC, you're buying it as joint tennis with somebody, you're buying it in your IRA. Uh, people own notes in all different forms. So we want to make sure that we're consistent with what that entity is. And then what we do is we go through a disclosure of what's covered, what the deductibles are, and then more important than anything else, what the exclusions are. So that in the event of a claim, we want to make sure you know what you have prior to a claim, prior to a loss, so that there's no surprises. So that's kind of a setup process that we go through here at Ross Diversified after doing this for 30 years. Uh, so there, again, if you have a claim scenario, you're going to know what you have prior to. Um, you know, Ross works with many private investors uh, prior to uh, uh, us getting online. We chatted for just a little bit. We work with uh, many different services out there, as well as, like I said earlier, some of the banks and credit unions and mortgage lender servicers. Uh, but uh, FCI is an example. Uh, we've known Mike over at FCI, the owner of FCI, for probably since the early 80s, so an awful long time. He runs a real clean shop. So a lot of times private investors are having their notes serviced by an entity like FCI. We'll work with that entity uh, and we'll work with you as a private uh, investor so that you can share your different assets as well. Um, some people service those notes where they buy that non-performing note and they're servicing it in their in their little office at home and, and that's fine as well. But we want to make sure that no matter who's servicing that note on your behalf that we have a, a vehicle for you to, to force place insurance and then should you go through the uh, the a, a eviction process a foreclosure process then we have a policy which we call the REO insurance component which works exactly like force place works except now that you become the owner of the property in an REO situation real estate owned you now have a liability exposure which changes everything uh, if someone's kids break in and get hurt uh, uh, and fall and slip, they're going to come back and see you as the owner. So you don't have that exposure on a note. You only have that once you've taken back a property as an REO. And is there any way to set that up? Uh, well, I guess not technically on an automatic situation, but I give you a call and, uh, you know, we're expecting to get the property back on XYZ date. Is there a way to kind of put that in place uh, not beforehand, but do you get what I'm saying? Like to make sure that we're covered as close to up to the minute as possible. How does, how does that transition work? It's a great question. And, and a lot of times, and, and, you know, I'm not an attorney and there's different foreclosure laws in all sorts of states in California. You can sometimes get through things in, in 111 days. And in some states like New York, it could take you two years to go through that foreclosure policies. Our policies are all written on an annual basis. Um, and we, uh, we do charge a $50 policy fee, but other than that, the premiums are 100% pro rata. So there's no rule of 78 or short run or any minimum fees that you're going to pay on a policy. So on the example that you just said, we don't know. Uh, again, you could um, you could be in California doing a foreclosure, and, and the wife can file bankruptcy, and then two months later, the husband can file bankruptcy, and they can play all sorts of games to kind of take you and make you scratch your head and say, geez, where am I going to get through this foreclosure process? And sometimes they go real fast. We actually just talked about on the show the other day, we had a borrower in Ohio. So he had filed 
uh, bankruptcy. Uh, then spouse had fire, filed bankruptcy, and then they deeded the property over to a friend who then also filed bankruptcy. Well, all I can it's tell been, you it's is been a, it's my, been a crazy deal. <laughs> in, in my in my wonderful thirty years of being so smart, I can I can tell whoever that 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 uh, investor is that I've experienced exactly the same thing on a property in two thousand and seven in, in Northern California that I was foreclosing on, and and it, it has a way of, of making you talk to yourself a few times because it was <laughs> the wife it was the husband, then it was the daughter, and then it was the son who wasn't even on title, but you still yeah. had to go through that process. But but the big the answer to your your big question is is we we will cancel the day that you actually do the sale. You do need to notify us. It's not an automatic process. You, you do need to be involved and be proactive in it. But it's it's primarily where, if let's say today's September 5th uh, and it goes to sale, we would cancel the forced order on September 5th. We would put the REO insurance policy on on September 5th. So you wouldn't be naked as far as coverage goes. We can do that very seamless, but you have to be uh, active. You have to be the catalyst to, to pick up the phone and call us and, and go through the actual mechanics. We cancel the forced order. You have a prorated fund. We put on the REO insurance. So, um, you know, um, you are active actively involved. It is two different policies, but for all intents and purposes, we make it real simple, the red form, the blue form, and we hold your hand through the process so that there is no confusion, but it is something that you have to be actively involved. That's why it's also so important, right? You've got to have a system in place to know XYZ is going down over here. You know, if, if you're doing the onesie twosie deals and you've only got a couple in your portfolio, obviously it's a little easier to keep track of. But once you start to get in the teens, 20s, 30s, 40s of deals going on at any given time, guys, this is why it's so important when it comes to the systems to be able to immediately know, okay, I need to call. I need to call over here today. I need to get the switch over here today. I need to do all this because uh, even a couple of days goes by and all of a sudden it could get hairy pretty quick. So again, when we talk about systems on the show, that's what we're talking about is being able to make those calls on the day it matters, get things switched over. It's not hard. It's not something that's going to take a, a ton of time. Like he just said, it's a red form, blue form, right? But it still needs to be done in a fashion, in a timely manner, because again, just a couple of hours, just a couple of days, just, you know, whatever the case may be, can really uh, spell a different scenario for you potentially. Yeah, no, I, I was just going to say that, you, again, you have to tickle it. We can anticipate a little bit. If, if you know property is going to sell uh, on Friday of this week and you have that sell date, we can be right on top of it so that, you know, you're not panicking going into that Friday weekend. But but our phones are pretty busy on Friday afternoons. And again, we try to answer it on the first ring and, and try to make sure that you're comfortable with the right policy you have going into the weekend so you can enjoy your Labor Day. I was going to say, you and I had a call over Labor Day. So he's not kidding, guys. He called me yesterday. I was in the middle of doing mowing my yard and I call him and he's like, oh, I got the grill going. Let's do this. Let's do the show tomorrow. He's not kidding. He will literally call you or, or have a conversation with you pending sometimes. I don't want to get you in trouble with your wife, but like that was crazy. I was like, who is this even calling me from California? I'm just going to finish what I'm doing here. This is crazy. Well, you know, again, we, we, we've been on both sides. We, we try to stick out our chest and show the very best service that we possibly can, and that's everybody here at our office. Uh, but before we lose sight, I wanted to go on one tangent here because this happens a lot of times uh, with a lot of our investor clients. What they're doing, and it's a very popular vehicle these days, are land contracts for sale. So a lot of times investors are buying a land contract, and they're assuming that they're buying a note the same way you'd buy a, a, a trustee or a mortgage, depending on what, what part of the country you're in. Uh, but these land contracts are completely different as far as how you insure them. We insure them as an REO because for all intents and purposes, if you buy a land contract, you are actually on title as being the owner of the property. It's almost like a lot of times they're, they're, they're vehicles that are used to sell the property back to maybe a previous uh, owner in there to give him a chance to kind of rehab his credit and, and make a, a non-performing performing or perhaps it's selling a property at very little down payment, but you don't want to actually sell the property <laughs> because you don't want to go through an eviction or a foreclosure process uh, through, uh, you know, being a, a owner uh, of the property. You want to own the property so that you can be more like a landlord asking uh, the the party to leave in, in a, a normal landlord eviction. So what I'm getting at here is if you're buying a land contract, we view those the same as an REO. And there's a lot of those going on right now. So you'd want to insure a land contract with 
liability, exactly like you're going to insure an REO. So just want to make sure everybody's really sailing with that. Land contracts we view, and again, I'm not trying to give legal advice or anything like that, but you have more exposure as a land contract because you're on title, you own it, and someone can sue you. Whereas if you're just a note holder, you don't have that same exposure. So uh, sum it up, land contracts we look at exactly like REO insurance. Oh man, I love that. Okay. So I've got a few more questions and what I love is that you came to the table with an agenda. You're like, here's, here's some stuff I want to do. I love it. So uh, even in on Facebook, literally 20 minutes before we uh, hooked up and hit record, someone was saying that they have a deal. I believe it's an asset in St. Petersburg, Florida. Now, obviously they have, I believe it's Irma. Don't I'm, I'm busy. Hand, I'm busily handling, you know, the Harvey stuff down here, right? Um, so I think I'm, I'm trying to stay up to date on my hurricanes. But they've got one headed their way. So they've got a note. They actually, I believe, have a um, uh, like a finalization date uh, on like October seventh. So they can't really do much with the deal. They're going to be, you know, they'll be taking it back from a foreclosure situation on the seventh. So like they want to stay in it. What? Aside from boarding up, right, their asset, presumably if it's vacant, if it isn't, like, how do you direct your, you know, clients or people who are in these scenarios or in these situations where obviously flood, you know, is a thing that we should probably address? Um, and then just general distress, like best best case scenario, here's what you could say to do uh, from the non-performing side, right? So this is going to be a scenario where they don't even have you know, I'm pretty sure it's occupied or else the question probably wouldn't have come through the same way. Um, but where, how do you address clients? What, what, what's your take on this situation? You know, unfortunately, I'm not going to give you a good answer that you're going to want to hear. Uh, you know, the insurance companies, you know, they're, they're, they're not uh, unsophisticated. And uh, well, let me talk on just real briefly uh, coverages and I'll be very quick, but our coverage on the uh program for the lender placed insurance that we're talking about and for uh, the REO insurance, the REO being the liability addition, you know, it has some nice things on it as far as no deductibles, but it's basically covering you for fire insurance. It does have a theft component, not of contents, but of actual structure. If someone ripped out the toilet seat or in the old days, we had copper piping being ripped out all the time. The older days just been 2007 or eight. Uh, we do have vandalism, malicious mischief, uh, and arson is protected. Uh, but let me touch the exclusions. It does not cover earthquake out here in California, and it does not cover flood insurance. Now, we do sell flood insurance both on a forced order type of forced order flood as well as we sell it through uh, FEMA through the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, there's a name storm going on right now. We have a freeze of all coverages in in Florida. Uh, I think that came on sometime uh on a Thursday or Friday of last week, Texas, they're just about ready to release uh, and allow us to start writing business. I think we're going to be allowed to write Texas later today or tomorrow. Uh, but the insurance companies are, are, you know, they're not foolish. They're not going to let you walk. They're not going to walk into a claim knowing that something's coming. So anytime there's a name storm, uh, then it's uh, it's going to be uh, a, a moratorium on writing any fire or any flood insurance in that area. And they won't even write the fire even when the flood's coming right at them because, you know, wind is a covered peril. I didn't mention that, but that's one of the covered perils on the uh, the forced placed insurance. So wind is going to cause a lot, a lot of damages. Here, I don't know if, if your investors are aware, I don't know if it really hit the national scene, but we had a, a major fire in, in Southern California here over the weekend. And fortunately, we got a little bit of rain, which we very rarely get uh, right at one of the most critical parts. And they actually shut down part of a 210 freeway, which is a major thoroughfare through, through California, Southern California and Burbank, California, Verdugo Hills, if anybody's familiar with those areas. But there was obviously we weren't going to be able to sell any fire insurance, forced order insurance in that area. So uh, bottom line is if you're buying an asset, you might want to decide if you want to hold off. You might want to decide if you want to do an inspection on it. But if you're buying an asset and there's a name storm or there's a name fire, that's coming right at that particular area, there's going to be a moratorium and you're not going to get coverage placed. Again, like I said, we have a freeze on all of Florida right now. So unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for that investor. So if they had something in place, right, then that kind of answers the question in general, right? Is, is if they had, you know, flood in place or something like that, right? 
Yeah, up until like uh, Tuesday or Wednesday of last week, we were writing a lot of Florida business. Um, and prior to Harvey, I don't know exactly when they shut us off of Harvey. I think it was about uh, 10 days ago or so. I don't have my days 100% accurate, but, but we were writing insurance in Texas, both flood, both fire, right up until the time they freezed us out. But when there's a name storm and it's coming close, it, you know, it's on the insurance company's got just as many radars, uh, you know, screens and GPSs up there is is the weather bureau, and there. probably more, probably more, because they've got they've got they got a slightly more profits, I'm sure. So, yeah. so in this scenario, it's obviously it's the name of the game, right? We're talking about insurance. We're talking about something that needs to be in place before something happens. So, if they did have something in place prior to, great. Uh, if not. You know, and it's and it's owner occupied. You try to maybe communicate, hey, what are you doing down there? If it's vacant, you you do what you can do there. I mean, so it's just one of those scenarios where hope it doesn't get you, or yeah, or you you like the topography of you hope you're on you hope you're on the 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 uh, you know on the high hill, right? Like something like that, right? Absolutely. You know, again, preparation is everything, and people don't like to hear that after the fact. One of the, the nice things about forced placed insurance and, and even FEMA, which is the National Flood Insurance Program, which we add a little bit more questions, basically forced order insurance. We're just asking for that property address and that coverage amount, which is coverages we touched on earlier. Uh, there is no geographical um, uh, restrictions we have on forced placed insurance. We write in all 50 states. Uh, we even uh, are working on a little deal maybe with Puerto Rico uh, and Mexico, but as of right now in Canada as well. But but we can handle forced placed insurance throughout the United States with no uh, no restrictions whatsoever. Um, it is it, and and we cover a lot of properties in Florida are with the wind coverage there. Uh, you know, sometimes forced place can be expensive, but we find that we're we're pretty competitive in Florida even with the regular marketplace. But there's no there's nobody who's going out and underwriting that property once you force place with us. But if there's a storm coming at you, unfortunately, uh, there's not a whole lot we can do once that storm's named and once the insurance companies and they're going to be ahead of the news. So yeah, if you're hearing sure. something on the news, the insurance companies they're they're, they're they're not asleep at the wheel on any of this. No, no, I, I wouldn't imagine so. I, I did have one other kind of quick question. Somebody had asked um, when I had mentioned that we were going to be having a conversation with you all today, uh, they had heard bandied about, as it were, uh, umbrella policy. Now, we've talked about force place. We've talked about insuring against that. With the notion of having a policy, say, over a portfolio or, uh, you know, if you have an anticipated value of a portfolio at any given time uh, with adding and, and dropping, you know, properties, what does that look like? Right. And, and umbrella and blanket are, are totally different terminologies. An umbrella policy, and I won't go too far on this tangent, but an umbrella policy, all they're doing is uh, they're following suit of any policy you have in place. So, for example, if I have insurance on a particular property, and typically it's, it's umbrellas are, are more in the liability area, uh, whatever my coverage, let's just say, for example, my homeowners is with Allstate, and I have a uh, $100,000 insurance policy with the house and half a million dollars for liability. People might have an umbrella policy of liability of, let's say, three or four million dollars, just picking numbers out of space. They're usually one, three, five million dollars is how umbrella policies are sold. What that umbrella policy does, it says, we want to know what your underlying policy is, that all-state policy, and then whatever coverages are on that all-state policy, we will stay uh, with. So we'll be whatever that policy is, we're going to mirror that policy, which is why they need to know what that policy is. And then whatever that policy's limits are will be our deductible. For example, the, the, the all-state policy right now, if that's a half a million dollar liability policy, it has to be a covered item in liability on the all-state policy. It has to exceed that half a million dollars before an umbrella ever kicks in. So an umbrella is kind of an overlining policy that follows suit with your underlining policy, and it's specifically really designed for liability coverages because the property coverages are going to already hit maximum with your with your regular primary coverage. A blanket policy is a completely different um, um, uh, type of a policy. And, and we'll have someone in, again, if you're a private investor and you're buying one or two or three different notes, um, you know, you're going to insure that particular asset 
uh, for the values like we talked about earlier. But now let's say I'm a big investor and let's say I want to buy no 25 homes in Florida. I want to buy uh, 50 homes in Detroit. I want to have a, a portfolio of, of several hundred policies. And typically, maybe we're going to get to that threshold. We'll call it like five or 600 properties. And it depends on the geographical uh, distribution of where those properties, they, they go a lot into the underwriting of that blanket policy that we're talking about. So now I might want to say, you know, instead of spending, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year on insurance, I'm just pulling numbers out of space here. I might want to reduce my my insurance advancements and maybe I only want to pay 30 or 40 or 50,000. Obviously, the number of properties and the geographical location and the value of the properties is what's making up these numbers. So I'm just pulling numbers out of space for the example. But I might want to say, okay, you know what i'm in florida right here right now but i don't really care about irma you know i think i want a policy and you know what the first twenty five thousand dollars will be my deductible and maybe i don't want to have wind included on that policy because i really want to re re reduce my insurance advancements so when it comes to a blanket policy if you have many many properties and if your desire is to really reduce insurance uh premiums then that becomes an option to you. But just know that when you're reducing insurance premiums, you're also reducing coverages or raising deductibles. So they go hand in hand. So for uh, a major portfolio, depending where that portfolio is, it's how much risk you want to take on. If you're buying one or two properties, you don't have that kind of an option even open to you. Um, you know. But again, blanket policies, you know, coverages and deductibles uh, have all the the the, the 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 makeup of how that policy is going to be underwritten. And if you've got, you know, 300 properties and it's in Tampa right now, um, you might want to have a blanket policy, but what coverages do you, do you really have and what risk do you really want to take? And can you be wiped out? And do you want to be wiped out? And again, it depends on your own personal business model and, and your risk tolerances and where all these assets are. So I don't want to get too heavy into these tangents. We do work with some blankets with certain customers, but I typically find about five, 600 properties is probably a bare minimum. And then it gets to be just these kind of questions. Do I want to self-insure for the first 25 grand and have a $25,000 deductible? Am I good with that and, and, and reduces enough premium advancement? Or am I like myself and a personal investor, which I don't have 500 different notes, you know, but on the notes I have, I'm okay with a $2,500 deductible, not a $25,000 deductible. So again, you have to look at the asset that you have and, and then kind of continue with whatever your risk tolerance is from there. So it's not like you can just buy this blanket that's going to help me sleep better at night uh, because, you, you know, you, you, you got to know what you're buying. I love and it. Sometimes yeah. it's... Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I want to be super respectful of your time. I appreciate you coming on the show today. Um, um, so the last question um, I'd have for you, and then obviously disseminate any bit of information you'd want the typical listener to know about, right, is as an investor, what is something that you, you have these conversations day in and day out? What is a new or experienced investor just not asking that they typically should when they're having a conversation with the insurance company? Is there, is it a coverage thing? Is it a, is it a question? Is it a, um, you know, what, what is it that you just see out there that, that you're like, oh man, I really wish more investors knew X. Well, you know, again, uh, we all learn as we go. I know that, um, uh, one of my favorite uh, sayings these days are, uh, you know, education is very expensive because you pay for it through your mistakes. Um, and and so what I've tried to do in my brother as well is, and it's not just us. I mean, we know a lot of our relationships have gone on for the entire 30 years we've been in business. We're, we're real proud of that. And so I try to learn from everybody as, as I go along and sometimes going to, you know, these different podcasts and these different groups is really try to, to pick up on what other investors are asking about. As an investor, you want to know what you're buying. You want to know what that asset is. If you have the opportunity to go and physically drive to that asset and see what it looks like, if you can pull up as many pictures on that asset as possible prior to purchasing it so you know what you're getting. Again, uh, the more information you have, the, the better you'll be. And then just know on insurance 
insurance that we're not here to to make your investment good our insurance is tied to the asset it's tied to the structure of that property which is probably the, the biggest thing we harped on at the very beginning of our conversation um as far as Ross diversified, my brother and myself, we, we really are very, very accessible. Um, you know, our, our number 1-800-210-7677, and, and I can give you some information on that. Uh, but we'd be more than happy to talk to anybody as much as they want. We, we advocate as many questions at the very beginning of a relationship and during uh, the relationship as possible. So um, that would be the one thing that I would say is if you write down all your questions, give us a holler and we'll address them one by one and do the very best possible we can. I love it. I love it so much. That was exactly the advice that um, I'm not, I'm sure you're familiar with him, but uh, Alex Goldowski, when he came on the show through Pro Title USA, when, when, you know, title insurance, you know, these are big components of a deal. And he said the exact same thing as the owner of Pro Title. He's like, line up your questions, call him directly, call somebody at his office, and they would do the exact same thing. And he has held true to that absolutely every single time I've pulled up a title report and I'm like, Alex, what am I looking at? Alex, what am I doing? So I know that you, you guys are going to be in the same boat. That'll be fantastic. Mel, I appreciate it. Thank you so much uh, for coming on the on the show today. And um, we'll have links to everything out to, uh, to your site and, and put everything that we've talked about today in the show notes. That way people can get in, in contact with you. So, uh, sir, I appreciate it. And, uh, I hope you have a, a, a wonderful week back from Labor Day. So I wish everybody, you know, health and a lot of success. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to come chat with you as well. Thank you very much. Alrighty, guys, that was Mel Babkis of Ross Diversified. I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I did. I love that he just geeks out and nerds out and just gets so deep and into the weeds on something like insurance, something that sometimes for some of us can be not necessarily an afterthought. We know it's important. We get it on the properties and all that kind of stuff, but it's not something we necessarily are always thinking about unless, of course, we're in the line of fire like we talked about with either Harvey or Irma, I think is the one coming in off Florida. Uh, You know, so it's really important to have this in place. And it's just fantastic to have somebody like Mel on with so much experience to talk about this kind of thing. Now, don't forget, I mentioned at the front of this episode, but if you're going to be out in Southern California, specifically, I believe, Orange County, Anaheim area, I'll be there for the Distressed Expo that's coming next week. So if you're going to be out there, I look forward to shaking hands and saying hi to anybody else that's out there. That would be super cool to kind of network, meet some people face-to-face that we have not already. Don't forget to use that promo code NOTE25. I think it might be all caps, but I'm not sure. NOTE25, it'll get you 25 bucks off on your ticket. We don't, you know, receive anything for that. It's just kind of a little thank you to you guys for being part of the community. If this is your first time here, head over to iTunes, give us a rating, give us a review, and of course, subscribe. Everything we talked about this week will be in the show notes over at NodaMBA.com. And as always, tell five other people you know this week about the NodaMBA podcast.